Hey, I'm Stephen Mealing, and I'm here with... I'm Pastor Tom. And this is Conversations for the Curious, where we dive deeper into the passages we're going to be talking about this week on Sunday. This right. week is Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. And it's a big deal because here that we're seeing in the Old Testament where God's going with humanity. Mm. It's that the idea that's saying, God is not saying that I want you to follow a bunch of rules outside of yourself. I'm going to change where I write the rules of life. I'm going to start writing on people's hearts about who I am and what I'm about. And I think it's this heart writings that we're talking about here that's going to give people power to live the life that God is calling them to live. And that yeah. reality is here now. Yeah. Amazingly, this book is written almost 600 years before Jesus comes around. And yet it talks in such specificity about what the work Jesus is going to do in the hearts of believers when he comes. It's amazing. It's powerful. And Pastor, do you want to read it for us? Okay. Well, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day I took them out of by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant they broke, though I was husband, declares the Lord. So this idea that's saying here that there was a one covenant that was made, that God came and rescued these people out of slavery for freedom, uh, and brought them and made them his own children, got them outside of the bondage of the Egyptians, okay? And he made a covenant with them, okay? But this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on, here we go, their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So that there was a covenant that God is saying to these people, uh, I took you out of the land of Egypt. You all got that. I rescued you. Now, here's a way you can respond to me. Mm. And he gives the, that's where Moses comes in. He gives the Ten Commandments. He's saying that's, that's not working. So I'm going to do something else in the future. This is 600 years before Christ. Thank you yeah. very much, Stephen. <laughs> and God is going to do something new. So he's describing this. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. So that forgiveness of sins is a key issue there that I really didn't emphasize too much when I put this together. But that, that is where the new covenant comes in. Yeah. So there's two rescues, really. We got the rescue of... The children of Israel from Egypt, and there's a new rescue, which is the releasing people from bondage of the things that stop them from living the life that God wants them to live, which comes down to two things. Love God, love other people. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing, as I read the whole chapter over, is I noticed, though, it seems like he's talking about Israel's upcoming captivity in Babylon, and he's warning them about that, but also giving them a promise that one day they'll be set free. So my question is, how do we understand this as a promise to believers when the context of the book and the chapter specifically is talking to Israel? Right. Well, again, we said last week, type, anti-type, when you go, whoa, whoa, yeah. I got to explain that one. There's a symbol here of something that happened in the Old Testament. And you can see it. I mean, it's right here, dividing between the old and the new. Yeah. Okay. And the old... Again, it was follow the Ten Commandments, do the will of God. A little static on and set. And a little static on the set. <laughs> and so he, he moved them from, uh, to something new. The old was about following the rules of the Ten Commandments. The new is that I'm going to write it on their hearts. And the way he's going to do it is that we're not going to follow these rules written in stone, but it's going to be part of who we are because of what Christ has done for us 600 years before. Yeah, I mean, if we look to this passage to see its fulfillment in Israel being set free from Babylon, we don't see these promises in here ever fulfilled. I mean, any Israelite, any Jew would say this was not fulfilled in freedom from captivity in Babylon. Yet we as believers see this passage as speaking to us as God puts his law in our, our hearts. He gives us an enriched uh, conscience because we have the Holy Spirit guiding our lives. But let me ask this question. It's addressed to Israel. It's addressed to Judea. How do Christians, how do we see ourselves, you know, scripturally as the fulfillment, as the, you know, as you were talking about type, anti-type, how do we see ourselves as the fulfillment of 
promises to Israel. Right. Well, the way you could read the Bible, basically, is that you can see all of the Old Testament is moving towards Christ and hitting that key point of Jesus coming. And he's, he's telling them people something's going to come, okay? And now when we, we are already been, we have seen what has come in Jesus, okay? So when we look at these, we see the prediction coming, pointing to Christ, okay? So, and even not to get too complex here, but once it all hits Christ, all of the New Testament is pointing back at Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of all things. Christ is the one who's going to change things. He's going to rescue us from slavery, not from being held by a political government, yeah. but rather the slavery is that we're stuck. Yeah. We can't live the life God wants us to live. And we are in bondage to sin. And this is what Jesus is trying to say to people. They're the one, well, well they're going, oh, we've never been in bondage to anybody. Well, they were, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we don't see that. He says, yes, you are. Yeah. You can't do it. You can't make it. You are in bondage. You cannot free yourself. I'm here to free you. And when I free you, I'm going to write my law on your heart. Mm. You're going to want to serve me. And you're not going to be perfect, but I want you to know you have been made perfect because of what I've done, not because of what you're going to do. So Christianity becomes a response to the grace of God. Yeah. The fulfillment. Yeah, so, so Christians, the believers, we become a kingdom, right? The Bible actually describes, you know, in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's building a kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And that kingdom takes the role of Israel. We become the new Israel. And, and in that way, you know, everyone who is of the old Israel, who is truly faithful and obedient to Jesus, who had faith and followed him, we are in the same lineage spiritually as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, those obedient, faithful people uh, to God throughout history. And we join this family with a rich history and we, we join in with their promises. And this is a promise to them, but it's also a promise to us as believers. Yeah, well, there it is in the Old Testament. You know, it's, it's a promise. This is coming. And we're living out the reality. But, you know, I, I would just say, whoa, well, there, you know, because it's not necessarily we're living out the reality. I would say that probably a lot of people see Christianity as rules. Yeah. You got to do this. You got to be this. You got to, hey, you got to go to church, you know, which, yeah, church is good. And you probably, if you're a believer, you're going to want to go to church. Uh, but it's not just about here are the rules of how to be a good person that God wants you to be. It's God fulfilling those rules for you. Yeah. And forgiving you for your foul ups, where you've gone too far, where you fall short of the glory of God. And so uh, it, it's all done in Jesus Christ. Most religions believe if you're going to get in right with God, you got to do the right stuff. Yeah. yeah. Where we're saying, no, it's not about what we're doing. It's about what Christ has done for us. Now life becomes living up to what we've received. And see, this is where it's coming from the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Even though our hearts are still messed up. You know, it's like, it's not going to happen perfectly until we cross the line into the kingdom of glory and we go yeah. to heaven. But uh, it's, it's there. We are the forgiven, love people of God. Yeah, isn't that amazing? It's such a blessing. But, you know, for a covenant, which is a, an agreement, a legal agreement to be established, especially this sort of one that's a priestly one, we need a priest, we need a, we need a system to handle that. And in the longest Old Testament quotation in all of the Bible, which is Hebrews 9, um, it actually quotes this passage in its entirety, or sorry, Hebrews 8, 8 through 12. Um, got all the numbers memorized. I actually have it what written. I, got. I cheat. I have it written down. Oh, you got it right. <laughs> but, but he goes into talking about how that, that Christ is rightfully seen as the high priest of humanity because he is able to establish this new covenant. So wh why was it essential that Christ would come and Christ would be the high priest of humanity so that we could have this covenant established? Right. I mean, that... that this is what Jesus did. He's, you know, prophet, priest, and king. I mean, the idea of a priest is your go-between. Yeah. You know, I like to say, well, it's like a priest is, you know, I've got access to the boss. I can get to him um, because I go to my priest or, you know, in, in terms of access, you, you know somebody who can get you there. What Jesus does is he opens up that door to get us there into a relationship with God. 
and it's uh, more than just something written on stone. It's written on the heart. Yeah. So the high priest of Jesus opens us up. And now what uh, we are described as in the New Testament is the uh, royal priesthood of God that we all have yeah. access. You know, I mean, I think this ties into why Jesus told us, pray in my name. In Jesus' name I pray. We're saying the high priest. Yeah. And we are priests now because we can get to God through Jesus. Yeah. You know, the, the high priest had to go in and make a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement, not just for himself, not just for Israel, but also so that the priests could carry out their roles successfully and not face judgment as they went close to God's presence. And, and you know, if you look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle is just a beautiful symbol, a picture of the walk of faith, right? You have where judgment is dealt with outside at the bronze altar. You have basically a picture of baptism at the, at the bronze laver where you wash up before you go in. And once you enter inside, there's three things. You have communion, which is you guys eating bread together in the presence of God. You have prayers, which is the table of incense, where the incense were seen as prayers of Israel going up to heaven. And, oh man, what was the last thing? There was one more in there. But the whole walk of a priest's life was this walking in the presence of God, carrying out these same things which were at one point exterior, were now interior to the hearts of the believer. Oh, sorry, yeah. the last one was, was the, 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 the light in there, the seven-branch light where, where, the we menorah, take, yeah. where we take, you know, the bless, what God has given us, his Holy Spirit, his anointing, and we make that into a light we show to the world. Yeah, and so we, we use that term, there's a symbol or the type of what was to come, and there's a symbol of the, the, the temple, you know, and then uh, Jesus, at, when he dies for the sins of the world, the, the Holy of Holy curtains is ripped open. Yeah, huh. which is there. There it is. It's access to God. You know, no more. We got to do this, this, and this, and this. The high priest can get us in, and the high priest has the lower priest that he sets them up to get them in. So the sacrifices are all good. Now it's just all fulfilled in Christ. All of the ceremonial laws have been wiped out in Jesus Christ. Yeah, uh, we we have access, and the the but the, the, the key is I I think we really need to stress the point. What God is doing with people is that he is going after the heart. He's going to create in us a clean heart, a new heart, oh God, yeah. and renew a right spirit from within us. This is where we get in on the action. Yeah, huh. You know, it's not just Jesus out there who did this. Okay, I see how he did this rule there. He fulfilled, oh, he forgives me. That, that is all true. But in our sanctified, in our new life, Christ has been, God has written down his commandments on our hearts and gives us the opportunity to live up to what we've received. Can I With, ask how he does that? How does he write his law on our heart? Well, I think it's a metaphoric thing. You know, yeah. of course, we use heart and we know that it's really our brains, mm -hmm. but yeah. uh, that he writes it on us by loving us. Hmm. by getting us to a place when we get what Jesus Christ did for us and we say, thanks be to God. There is a power there. Yeah. And that uh, he has, the, we have been washed clean by the blood of lamb who takes away the sins of the world and we have been made right through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, we've been made right through his death on the cross. We have been made right by his righteousness and we say, thanks be to God. How can I respond to that? But that, I think it's that, Stephen, it's that thanks be to God. Yeah. You know, that depth of who you are saying, yeah, I am a child of God. Mm. I have a new identity. Um, there it is. That's the heart writing, mm. you know, rather than, okay, well, I, I was baptized Episcopalian or Lutheran. Yeah, yeah. I was baptized Catholic. I go to this church, and my pastor has all the truth of my life. Uh, about who God is, and I just live my life, whatever. But there's a, a new creation in Jesus Christ. And the thing is that we don't, we'll never totally get this down. You know, yeah. it's not to say that, hey, you've got to be on fire for the Lord. Well, that's a good thing. It shows a response, but we're always going to have our sinful nature. But Jesus Christ is our hope. Yeah. He made us right. Now, I know in the next month, in April, we're going to be talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. You're starting a series on the Holy Spirit. Yeah. How does this writing on the heart connect to the Holy Spirit? And how is that a, a work of the Holy Spirit in our life? Right, that God gives us, and we're going to talk about this in next month in April, God gives us as a deposit the Holy Spirit in our life, mm. you know. 
I would say that that's not, you know, here we go. We go back to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, it is kind of like, uh, he did these things. Here's the Ten Commandments. Here's the ceremonial laws that you have to do. Mm. Okay. But the new one, when I will write on their hearts. See, this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is that conviction with deep within us. That, and they, he causes us a deposit of what's to come, which the Holy Spirit becomes the, is the very presence of God in our lives. Yeah, yeah, and see, really. that's where I think where we get into Jeremiah and the new covenant. Because the old covenant is God did his part. Now, okay, here's your response. The new covenant is God does it all. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we are free. We are free from being under the bondage of, you got to do this, you got to do that, got to do this. Jesus Christ has fulfilled all things. Now life becomes a response. Life becomes a living up to what we've received in Christ. Yeah, right. It's a, our, our righteousness is a reaction to the gift given to us in Jesus Christ. Right. You know, it's like Paul says in, I think it's Romans 5 or maybe even Romans 8. Romans 8's packed. But, uh, the idea of, uh, well, if we're saved by our foul-ups in life, our mess-ups where we miss the marks, should we ought to just keep on doing that so we can be saved all the more? He says, certainly not. We are a new creation. Yeah. We are a new creation in Christ. Okay. Now, we're talking about this stuff, you know. <laughs> information, information, information. But I would say that, you know, if you're saying, what, what? Seek, seek these things. There's something greater. God wants to work from the depths. I think maybe there's a lot of people who know being a Christian is more than just following a bunch of rules that are outside of yourself written on stone. Yeah. They marvel at us when we mess up, and sometimes rightly so. Yeah. You know, for all the Christians who want to grab a hold of politics and believe that our job is to straighten out society and, you know, uh, get people to follow the rules of God or follow our heritage or they worship their country. Uh, uh, going too far, and we get criticized because that leads us to cruelty, and it le leads us to doing activities that people kind of know in their hearts. I don't think that's really of God. <laughs> and that, uh, so the heart clings to the wrong things, and so, but there it is again, you know. We grab a hold of this stuff, what God does throughout the rest of our life, say, let go, let go. You know, you, you want to make yourself righteous by what you do? Let go. You want to believe that you have the truth for society? Let go. You know, it's not to say that we, we don't have to continue in these issues. We do. We, uh, we have to figure out how we live together. But um, when God writes on the heart, uh, the Holy Spirit will convict us when we're gone off of the heart and what Christ has written on our hearts. Uh, if that's the case, why do we get new convictions as we continue in our walk in faith like I, the holy spirit writes on our heart we're given a new heart all these things but i will, will get along in life and i will experience a new conviction for something i didn't know was wrong until i got there later is this an ongoing work or is this fulfilled right. this is what we call you know we get too technical with everybody today but this is what we call sanctification okay sanctification is growing in christ sanctification is a life long journey responding to God's grace and sanctification I believe mostly has to do with letting go letting go you cling to that you know the classic is people cling to their cash you know even though I say politics can be one of the big issues today but people cling to their money they cling to their family they cling to their education they cling to what the world says makes them good it's learning to let go and saying no it's Christ that makes my life. And so these things get revealed to us after time. You know, and, but if they do, I think that's a good sign because it shows you're growing. Mm. You know, if you say, well, I, you know, most people's minds today, I would argue, their minds work around justifying themselves. Yeah. They, they pick a, a topic they believe they're right in, and then their brains go to work trying to justify, 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 that we don't need to do that anymore. Um, because our righteousness and believing that we are all, have all truth is not based in those things, uh, but it's based in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now, now looking at the last verse here, I, this one's a little weird to me, a little mystifying. You'll have to help me break this down. Because it almost seems like, obviously, everyone who fulfills this, this 
scripture would be a Christian or a believer. So how would this make sense? Verse 34, no longer uh, will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will, know, they will all know me from the greatest to the least of them. Okay, so, right, I think that, that, that if you go back through the two, the two verses before, it says he will write on their hearts. Well, God writes uh, his commandments on their hearts, gets them to know the person next to you who follows Jesus Christ, his uh, or her uh, life has been written on through the, the love of God. So people know Christ in those situations, okay? And that as they all know Christ, there's a binding together. It's not like one person, let me tell you who God is. No, it's not going to happen at first. Yeah. But they already know who God is because God has affected them and written on their hearts mm. through Jesus Christ. And then there is a power that binds us together. So I, I would say that you, not only do you have a power that binds you together and that Jesus is up on the top and all people are following him, uh, there is a binding together there, but there's also a binding together with our relationships with others that our needs have been met in Christ. Mm. I don't need to be right anymore. Yeah. I don't need to, I'm not trying to get something anymore because I, everything I need in my life has been given in Christ. Mm. That has a binding effect uh, through our relationships with other people. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That's, yeah. You Maybe like that? Even heals our relationships with others. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the last thing I had here was this. Um, before the passage starts, there's this interesting two-verse little segment. I'm going to read it. And then I want to play it against the very last words of the last verses in our passage that we have. So verse 29 says this. In those days, people will no longer say the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Basically, kids are not going to receive the punishment for the sins of their father. And then it says, verse 30, Instead, everyone will die for his own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, his own teeth will be set on edge. So people are going to receive the punishment for their sin. But then it goes into this whole passage, which we just studied, about, you know, Jesus fulfilling this role and humanity being saved in Jesus and law being written on their heart. And it ends 34 with this verse. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. Right. Well, I think that last line is the key to it all. That's what Jesus Christ has done. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. And when we get it, wow, it's all been fulfilled in Christ. There's the heart writing. Mm. Um, you know, you speak a lot of things about there. It just reminds me of somebody needing a lot of dental work 2,000 years ago, you know, <laughs> with their teeth and they're, you know, going bad and everything. Uh, you know, the sins of the parents can be seen in the children. And you know, going back to what you said earlier, Stu, Stephen, you know, a lot of the issues that stop us from being the people that God wants us to be in this life uh, oftentimes come from our family of origin, you know? Yeah. Uh, what makes you a righteous person? Well, we learn that from our parents, either by misunderstanding them or if they're Christian or... Uh, them intentionally teaching us some things and it's learning to let go because we are the children of God um, so the sins of the parents can affect us but there again it's letting go mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be that way you know when, you, when a person begins to grow beyond their family of origin into who their heavenly father their new father in heaven uh, that's a sign of sanctification mm -hmm. I've heard and I don't know if it's true that very few people are able to do that um, but it can happen in Christ, and it does happen. It, it must happen, I think, in Christ with, I use the word must as law, with the new writing on the heart. Yeah. Yeah, with that, guys, that's our episode. We really appreciate you tuning in. Take this to heart. Read the rest of the chapter. Understand how the work of God in our hearts is not just to save us this one time. Actually, I threw out this saying, and I didn't explain it earlier, but this idea that we are saved, we were saved, we are being saved and we're going to be saved. If you're a Christian, you have been saved and your eternity is certain with Jesus. But you are ongoing. The work of the Holy Spirit is working in your heart. You are experiencing sanctification. You are growing in that relationship. And you look forward to the day when we will truly be saved in that we will no longer be on earth, but we will have an eternity with our Savior. And this passage gives us great hope in prophecy of what God has to offer us. 
Yeah, at the, there's the sanctification. And, and I would just reiterate too, Stephen, that we are saved because of what Christ has done, not through our sanctified life. Amen. Yeah. So, amen. Um, hey, what, want to invite people to church? Yeah, why not? Let's do that. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you made it to the end, you must really like us. Hey, if you're in Sonora area, Sonora, California, we're St. Matthew Lutheran Church. We're a body of believers who are trying to get closer to our Savior, to get to know our Savior, and to be in relationship with Him. If you're looking right. for a body of believers like that in this area, please come and join us. But if you are one of our many global, local, distant friends, find a church, find a body of believers around you this Sunday and connect with them. Good enough. God's peace, everybody.